Hello, everyone, and welcome to Speaking of the Arts. Today's episode is part two of my conversation with Ulysses Owens Jr. If you did not listen to part one, I would suggest you actually start there before listening to part two. In today's episode, we cover what I would consider essential information for both artists and presenters, including how Ulysses avoids burnout, how to break out of the artist sidemen mentality, when you should start saying no, Ulysses' new touring projects, diversity and inclusion in the arts, and why a comprehensive educational outreach program is really essential for every arts organization, and what Ulysses is currently reading. I want to say thanks again to Ulysses for his time and wisdom. I learned so much from speaking to him, and I hope you will too. Please enjoy part two of my conversation with Ulysses Owens Jr. So, uh, yeah, man. So, um, so you just got back from Minnesota? Well, no. So I did, man. I'm, you know, I'm bouncing around. I know it's hard to keep up. So I, I was in Minnesota when we spoke, and then I came back to Florida. And then I went to, I don't know if you've heard about this place. It's a dance residency sort of Mecca, uh, which is called Jacob's Pillow. And uh, uh, it's, it's in um, Beckett, Massachusetts. Okay. So I was working with a wonderful uh, collaborator and dancer. Her name is Latasha Barnes. And uh, Latasha is really hip, man. She's probably one of the greatest Lindy Hop, you know, dancers and uh, really of all forms. Uh, but she special, specializes in Lindy Hop and whacking and hip hop and house. And she travels around the world. And so she and I met actually at a Lincoln Center event called Midsummer Night Swing that they do every summer with like a, a, a big band and all that. Um, so anyway, so she's developing this work and it's called the Jazz Continuum. When it's essentially this project that traces like the very beginnings of jazz dance to, you know, where we are today, like, you know, hip hop and house and sort of popular movement. And wow. it's really fascinating, man. I mean, you know, on her, on the, the movement side, they're uh, tracing movements all the way back to the early 1900s. Uh, and what we thought was sort of this modern like break dancing or whatever that we saw kind of emerge in the eighties is really something that started as early as 1919. So oh that's the, yeah, that's the movement side. And, and on the band side, she uh, hired myself, Christopher McBride, who's an incredible alto saxophonist. Uh, and then also she hired John Thomas, who was the music director and this incredible DJ, uh, Brittany. Um, so yeah, it was really cool, man. So we were there for like a week, you know, they were there in a bubble for like two weeks before me. And then we sort of got, when I got there, we mounted the show and it became, uh, this really cool moment. And we did about eight shows out of the 10 that were scheduled, um, because of weather and stuff, but yeah, man. So I just got back from that, um, yesterday to New York and then I flew back to Florida today. So wow. there's a little bit of bouncing around. Yeah. <laughs> but, um, but well, I'm okay I, I was going to ask you about the everwood farmstead residency because that's sure. what you were up to so um yeah i mean i'd love to hear what that was about and what, what sure so everwood is a is a really cool place that uh apparently has been uh farmland for many many years but uh the guy chris everett who he and his partner they live on the land um they sort of re renovated these homes you know one is the home that he lives in another is kind of a a mixture between like a house and a cottage and their goal, I think, based on some grant activities and things like that, um, they wanted to be a haven for artists to come and develop new work. And they had this really, really cool barn as well. They stayed shows out there and stuff like that. Um, due to COVID, there's a lot of limits to kind of what they've been doing, but it's a really, really cool spot. So what I, I did um, being that I went there really to write and to like strategize, um, I had just come off of a really big moment with the camp, you know, with my kids, Don't Miss a Beat, we just done the festival. Uh, this year, you know, I released a book, a new album. It's just, I've, I've put out a lot of stuff this year. So I think my goal was to kind of like go inward and sort of say like, okay, what's what's next, Ulysses? And like, what do you want to do creatively? Because I find that like, when you come off of really big highs as creatives, whether it's a jazz festival or even a gig, you know, if you played Dizzy's tonight or you, you know, uh, launched a tour or whatever uh, moment that you got to produce and put something out into the world, I find that, if we're not careful, we'll kind of live in that space for a long time of like, oh, you know, it'd be two years later and you're like, yeah, I put out an album two years ago. Well, my question and my, or I shouldn't say my question, my pursuit is to always be like competing with myself and always saying, okay, how can I outdo myself and how can I like move ahead of myself? So this moment at Everwood was really great because I had a chance to one, just be quiet 
uh, it was just myself there. It was me in the woods. And I got to like really reflect because I'm a person that I recharge alone and I recharge like with like moments of stillness. And then I come out of them with like these Eureka ideas or moments. Um, and I'm like, oh, okay. So that's what I want to do. So that's what Everwood was. Um, I was there for three days. Normally they offer artists up to like seven days and they bring in multidisciplinary artists, everybody from DJs, composers, choreographers, you know, video producers. Um, but yeah, it was great, man. I, and it was the first time I'd ever done a residency. And though I would probably apply for more, I know that now, like, I want to factor that into my process every year. I think like after my summer camp, which is a big, you know, I'll be doing that the rest of my life, fortunately. Um, after that, I will probably always factor in that time to just like steal away to someplace quiet to just kind of collect myself and then figure out what's next. So. Yeah, you know, I think it's important to highlight that exact act, uh, taking the time to do that. A lot yeah. of people don't do that. And uh, I was fortunate, I was uh, um, in this group for a few years called the Strategic Coach. It's specifically wow. for entrepreneurs, uh, nice. but of all industries. And nice. so in a nutshell, what this is, is I would meet uh, once a quarter in Chicago with other entrepreneurs and we had a coach and um, uh, we would, it would be a one day, uh, eight hour day, just devoted wow. to you, like to me, wow. right? Wow. And, and you get to do uh, a couple of things. One is um, focus on how to grow your business, but the other two is uh, personal development as well. Wow. And the, the reason I bring that up is because they, the strategic coach has an entire, what they call the entrepreneurial time system. Hmm. So, because they realize, you know, okay, there's a, such a difference, as you know, between someone who works for themselves versus right. someone who is part of another system. Right. And if you work, and so a lot of, and they started to notice a lot of their clients making the transition. They were working for somebody else. Then they decided to go off and do their own thing. And a lot wow. of their clients were experiencing just severe burnout because they wow. were still on the clock in, clock out, every day, every day mentality. Wow. Or as an entrepreneur, just go, 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 go. Right, 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 right. So the entrepreneurial time system builds in what they call a free day. Um, and it's up to you when you want to take a free day, but it has okay. to be a full 24 hours, no work. Just, wow. Just you. Or it could be family, but no work. Mm -hmm. Not, like mm -hmm. Nothing, no email, nothing. And wow. when you start to slowly get in the habit of doing that for yourself, you completely um, become, you, you come back completely charged. And I love that. So I'm not at all surprised to hear, you know, you have three full days to just yeah. focus inward and yeah. recharge. It's yeah, so important. Well, it is. And I think because, you know, as you know, being an entrepreneur, there's the other side that kind of encourages this, like, go, 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 always be creating, always be creating. And I think that that is important. I do think entrepreneurs naturally have to be creative people. But I, I also think that if you're burned out, you can't create nothing, right? right. Um, and there's, and I think there's, as I get older, I realize there's different stages of burnout. Like there's emotional burnout, there's spiritual burnout, there's mental burnout. Um, there's even like, you know, what I feel like is artistic burnout, right? And so I think yes. the goal is when you go into these sort of like shelters, these safe havens, you get to kind of like, you know, turn the, the, the coolers or the, you know, the burners down on all fronts and just cater to yourself, you know, um, and I've kind of never really done that. I've always been like, okay, well, I'm, I'm chilling, like for COVID, all of us were chilling from the stage, right? So we all were like getting refilled or refueled artistically, but we all, you know, some of us were stressed about different things, maybe economically, or maybe you, you were in a home with family that had different issues. So I think in these moments, for me, which I like them to be short, like I can't do a five day residency at this stage of my life. But I do like three or four days where I can just kind of like, you know, uh, turn everything down and just kind of like, and just be, be in the moment. And just my only focus for the day is what am I gonna cook or what am I gonna, you know, read today, like and take in. So yeah, man, it was, it was great. I'm very yeah, thankful. Yeah. I joined this program, the uh, strategic coach program. I think I had been running my agency for let's say over three years. And that okay. first day in that workshop when they told us about the time system, it dawned on me, I hadn't really like taken a full day in yeah. like three years. Because even if you tell yeah. yourself, well, it's Sunday, I'm, I'm not gonna work, but right. checking email here, an hour Absolutely. later checking email, an hour later checking, it's like, okay, you're still working. Yeah, which I think we should, you know, at some point we should really unpack that, I think as modern day people, because there was a break from work before, you know, like yes. I remember growing up, 
you know, and I, I think you and I are probably not too far in age, but I remember growing up as an 80s baby where my parents had their weekends, you know, and, and yes. other than like a phone message that someone can leave and even at a certain point, the tape ran out of that, right? Because right? um, there was at this point, there were no automated voicemail systems where you could leave endless messages. There was a limit of how much could get to you. You know what I mean? Absolutely. And so I think now it's okay. Not only can you leave me tons of voicemails, you can also leave me tons of voice memos. You can send me tons of text messages. You can then send me a bunch of emails and then you can send me a bunch of direct messages on 20 different platforms, right. you know? So we are now so plugged in that I think um, the question will be later is who are we when we're not plugged in? And I, and, and I start with myself. I mean, I'm getting ready to implement um, some technology fasting soon because I feel like I'm so addicted, you know, to to my phone and to my computer and stuff. And I just I need to make sure that I that I have the right relationship with it. So yeah, man, it's all yeah. those residencies and those things that they create it creates the ability to even think about that kind of stuff. Yeah, I want to send you a tool from the program that I use almost Please. I don't know about every day, but at least three times a month. Please. Um, and so real quick, it's called the impact filter. And it's wow. a one it's a one page PDF, or you can print it out, do it on okay. your computer, whatever you prefer. And what it does is if you have an idea for anything, project, something complicated, something simple, okay. it, it, it gets you to identify if you were to do this, what are the success criteria? Wow, nice. It, right? And, and so basically this idea of you have to sell yourself before you can sell somebody else. Ooh, I like that. And I just have this feeling that you being so busy and prolific and thinking yeah. about, should I do this? Should I do that? Should I do this? Yeah. I, I can't tell you how great this tool is. It's, I love and, that. and here's the real beauty of it. Once you kind of get familiar with it, yeah. you want to be in a position where you hand it off to somebody. I so love like, that. If you have an assist, let's say you have an assistant. Yeah. I, I have this idea. Well, how many times do things get lost in translation, whether it's right. just me talking to you or me trying to communicate right. it to 30 people? Right, 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 right. If I do this simple exercise, it takes five minutes, I hand it off, people will get right away what this is. Yeah. And then the beauty of it for you as the entrepreneur is that's it. You don't have to do anything else. Right, right, right. I love that. You know, so it's funny. That brings me back to uh, a point that I learned from a really well-known musician uh, a long time ago. And he gave me kind of, I'll, I'll, I'll sort of speak about it loosely, but he gave Can me- like, who's the musician? <laughs> well, I'll, I'll just tell you, uh, McBride told me um, a long time ago, he gave me like this criteria for like a way to measure different gigs. And um, I'm not gonna give away like his secret, but I'll, I'll just kind of sum it up in different ways of like, one of the things he told me was to think about like one, why, like, why do you want to do this gig, right? Like, especially once you get past the point of like, I, you know, I always sort of talk about the juxtaposition of making a living versus designing a career, right? And so I think most people, probably 90% of musicians make uh, money or they, they make music to make money at a certain point, right? Because that's what they've chosen. Once I feel like you tap into like, okay, money is a, is a thing, but it's not my main motivation. And now you start saying, okay, I'm gonna design a career. One of the first things he talked about was like, why? Like, you need to understand like why you're doing this. And, and then, you know, same because I was saying yes to all these different things. And he talked about kind of like, okay, one, you got to think about why are you doing this? Two, you know, what are the different uh, levels of impact that could, could be there for your career? Yes. You know, and he gave me these sort of different measuring tools of, okay, you know, is it something you feel like, you know, you're going to learn a lot from that particular musician? You know, is this something where you feel like that musician, not only are you going to learn, but they're going to give you a level of exposure to certain things. Um, so he gave me a lot of different sort of measuring tools to think about, like, why are you doing this as opposed to, everybody's just, you know, or, or you're wanting everybody to call you. What is that specific reason why you're doing stuff? And I think I speak about this um, a little bit in the book as well, but I think that for me, to your point about the impact, I was driven really long for a really long period of time by doing things that people thought that I couldn't do or shouldn't do, mm -hmm. right? And I think by the time I started working with people like the McBrides or Kurt Elling or whomever, it shifted from like, all right, I don't need to prove anything anymore because I'm working with people who their, their life is not to prove things. And I think that was what working with those guys taught me the most about was Kurt and McBride and Nick Payton and all the other people I got to work with, they weren't doing things to prove a point. 
to anybody but themselves, <laughs> you know? Yeah. And I think that goes back to that impact sheet of like, I remember talking to Kurt one day and being like, Kurt, Kurt one of the things that amazes me about him is by the time he finishes his, his, like he's on the road right now with this project Super Blue with Charlie Hunter and Corey Fonville or whatever. I bet that Kurt already is in the motion of what his next project is. And that was one of the things that I, that I learned from him. Like by the time, you know, we were touring dedicated to you, he was already thinking about his album, The Gate. By the time we did The Gate, he was already thinking about, you know, the next project. By the time we did, uh, I think it was this, uh, uh, a live at Berlin record, he was already thinking about this super blue thing, you know? And so he's always like producing, but then also he has something in incubation. And I saw something very similar with McBride and, and Nick Payton and even like Amante Alexander. It's like, they had these ideas or even Winton, they had these ideas about like what they were doing and they were fully engaged in like whatever we were doing. Like if we were out on the road with the trio or if Went was out on the road with his big thing, like he was absolutely engaged but it was already a weld on machine and he was thinking about like what is the next thing and and for all of them I could unanimously say what I learned from them was what their guiding light was not their success their guiding light was sort of this body of work or this this extension of a legacy that they want to continue to build yeah. and so that's kind of what I back to your point that's what I like built in um, to my life it's sort of these measuring tools of why am I doing this what is it bringing to the table you know, is it furthering me in a certain kind of way, you know, and then that helps you to measure because money should, I, I say to people at a certain point, money should never be your motivating factor in why you take something. Because I tell people I play for free, but you pay for my time, you know, so yeah, that's yeah. a very big thing for me. So anyway, I just, I know. Pun intended. Saying, but, <laughs> what is that? Pun intended. Right. <laughs> right. That's great. Not, and I tell people my time gets more expensive every year. <laughs> yeah, because it keeps getting better and better every year. You know, so it's same for you or anybody, you know, it's like cause the time that I could be giving you, especially now, I will say this, the time that I could be giving someone else's project, I could be building something that is really important to me and not saying that other people's work isn't important to me, but your work will never be more important to me than it is to you. Sure. You know what I mean? Like, yeah. it, I, it's important. I'm like, man, you're a great guy. I hope this works well, but it's not something I created with you. Right. So I'm always trying to make sure, because, you know, as, as that sort of side man philosophy, um, which I've been for many years, sometimes you get stuck in the side man philosophy of like, you're just constantly trying to figure out how to make everybody else better. And you look up and you're like, what the hell did I do for me? You know, so anyway, right. I, I go off on tangents. Yeah, no, it's all good. <laughs> no, well, thank you for sharing the uh, McBride story, because I've had the good fortune of working with the pianist Fred Hirsch for many years. Oh, Fred is great. Yeah, and he's always been very clear about his, I'll call it the impact filter, that's not what he calls it, but his criteria for accepting a gig. And it's either, it's one of three things. And ideally you hit all three marks, but that doesn't always happen. But you know, certainly money is a factor. Mm -hmm. Is this gonna, how does this relate to him um, artistically? Is it important mm -hmm. artistically? And then um, how does this relate to his career? So one of those three things, right? And you just said that. And so I'm not at all surprised to hear that Christian has a very similar criteria list. But I think for young musicians starting out, you know, where it's like, first of all, the, the burden of, can I make, can I do this? Can I make a yeah. living doing this? Of yeah, course, yeah. money is a big factor, but how do you start to weigh those three components? It's really yeah. important. But, but I, wanna, I wanna put one more thing in there, Mike, that I think we have to think about, or I think we should consider, and because I know you have other things you wanna talk about, we have to consider the phase of life and career we're in, right? Yes. So if you are a 19-year-old, 20-year-old college student and you're at, you know, you're studying, I don't think, and this is gonna sound kind of harsh, I don't think you have the ability to make those decisions right now. Right. Like I think like because I because I also remember when I met, you know, McBride and Winston and all these guys when I was a freshman in college, and their goal, their thing for me was take everything. Right. Yes. So I, I so I think we have to figure out like where you are. Like one of my mentees texted me the other day and she said, you know, Mr. Owens, I, I, I think I got myself on a pickle. And I said, well, what, what happened? And she said, well, you know, I, I uh, got called for this gig. Um, it's really far. You know, basically, I accepted it before I realized one is really far from where I live Two, the rehearsals really far from where I live. And three, I don't even know what I'm getting paid. Mm -hmm. And I, I said to her, I said, well, with all due respect, at your age, it shouldn't matter. <laughs> like, <laughs> I was like, travel to Timbuktu, like, because part of what allowed me 
to do these panels or sit and write this book is that I've done that before and many times over. So I think, you know, I just want to clarify for those that are watching this, if you are in a stage of your career, particularly under 30, and you're still cutting your teeth, I think you need to not be worried about the criteria of three. I sure. think to me, when you get past that point where you've built some things, you've, you've got a voice out here, you're working, you're built, you know, you've built a really good career and you're continuing to build kind of past that sort of initial onset, then that's when I think you need to start entertaining the criteria. Fred Hirsch is a prolific dynamic musician and has been for multiple decades. You know what I mean? Um, I'm just now entering that stage where I'm starting to make a name for myself and, you know, aside from the people I've worked with. So now it's time for me to be very strategic. But if you haven't gotten to that point, I think you should take everything because everything will lead you to being more specific about what you want. Yeah, it's amazing, right? We, we can almost summarize. It's, it's like there's a great crossover that has to happen, right? You go mm -hmm. through a period of you have to say yes to everything. Mm -hmm. And then you go mm -hmm. through a period where you have to learn how to say no. <laughs> right, right, right. right. It, yeah. And nobody can, you know, nobody can tell you when you're ready. But I think, I think you'll know when you're ready to, to be more strategic. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Well, uh, folks, thanks for tuning in again. We're, we're doing part two here with Ulysses Owens <laughs> Jr. And uh, Ulysses, I wanted to make sure you had an opportunity to speak a little bit about your current projects, specifically your current touring projects. Maybe, sure. uh, let me ask you, let's just pick between now, 12 months out, 24 months out, you know, next sure. year or so. Because a lot of people listening to this, um, we, we really do try to cater this specifically to presenters and promoters. Oh, nice. So okay. what should they know that you're up to uh, touring wise or what you would like to be doing? Sure. Well, I'll tell you the two things that I'm the most focused on, and I'll, I'll start, since this is particularly pr for presenters and promoters, yeah. with a project that is the, the easiest to move around. And that is a project called um, UOJ, or Ulysses Owens Jr., Generation Y Band. And that band features uh, the stellar Alexa Tarantino on alto saxophone and doubles, uh, uh, Drew Ashby Anderson, a young trumpeter out of uh, Virginia, and Phil Norris, who, uh, like Alexa, was my student at Juilliard, and Luther Allison, who was a wonderful young pianist uh, from Charlotte, North Carolina, but in, North, uh, but in New York. Um, that project is really kind of a brainchild of Miles Weinstein, my manager, and myself, because I just sort of come off the heels of Songs of Freedom. Uh, my project dedicated to Nina Simone and Abby Lincoln and, and Joni Mitchell. And he was like, Ulysses, I love the fact that you've got like this mastermind of like all this cool stuff you want to do. But he was like, dude, like we need to get you, you need to get a band that you can really move around and develop, like not these larger, I'm like, continue to do that. But the, you know, they're kind of one-offs. So he was like, you know, what, what do you feel comfortable doing? And it was a, it was a really frustrating conversation. I mean, Miles and I, we, it wasn't an a argument, but it was a very heated uh, disagreement, but not from a negative place, but like, cause he was challenging me like, dude, like, what do you want to do? And, um, and so anyway, what we came up with was I've always loved playing quintet. I had a band for many years, New Century Jazz Quintet, um, but it was primarily based in Japan. But I remember playing quintet and it felt at home. It felt like sort of channeling sort of the Blakey vibe, but, some, but it, just, it was just the right combination. So I was like, all right, cool. I know I want to have a quintet. Second, I was like, I want young players um, because I want players that I feel like can, can push me to the next level um, with their fresh energy and, and, and even sometimes their unknowingness. Um, that pushes me too, you know? So anyway, so we came up with it, came up with the players and we started, I guess, about two years ago. And we've been really fortunate that uh, I think we got like a couple of gigs. We did like Dizzy's and Jazz Standard and all that then the pandemic happened, but then people really loved the idea because they're like, wow, you are at sort of at this point in your career where you're kind of like giving back what you've been given. So yeah, man, it's been great. And now, I mean, you know, we're, we're booked. I mean, we don't have much this year, but next year has really been great, man. We got several long tours planned. Uh, yeah. My goal now is for us to be able to go to Europe and to go to, to Japan and be able to take this group and tour with them. So that I would say is my main focus is I really would love to see you know, uh, uh, eight to nine months, you know, throughout a year, if not more of just constant touring with, with my band. Um, and then the other facet of that, which kind of grows out of Gen Y, um, is the Ulysses Owens Jr. Big Band, which I have the, the CD that um, just launched. And for whatever reason, people really like that as well. And so I'm already starting to get some bookings. We have a couple of really cool concerts coming up. Actually, we're gonna be in the Illinois uh, Midwest area and we're going to be doing a concert 
uh, at a cool festival out there. And I got Marquise Hill. He's going to be a guest with us. So I think for me, what I'd love to see is this, this combination of a couple really, or not a couple, but a few festival dates with the big band, because I think that band has got a great energy and is full of a lot of youthful, uh, but experienced energy and also is multi-gender uh, and, and multi-racial. Um, but the music is very real. <laughs> multi-generational yeah and that music is so i i, I like it because it's, it's big band but it's not big bandy you know that makes um, sense you know what i mean like so anyway so i'm excited about about that and miles has been working hard um with that as well so yeah man so so those are the two things i'm really excited about and then obviously um the book i've got a bunch of speaking engagements coming up with the book um i'm really excited this year i'm gonna be at PASIC progressive arts society International Convention. I'm presenting a workshop on my brush book. Uh, I got a thank you, thank you. I've got a couple uh, online courses coming out with Open Studio. Who I think that's one of the ways that we sort of met. Yes. Um, and directly, um, I have a course. I'm man. I'm like so excited. It's it's going to be called Jazz Drumming 101. Let me just read it because I don't want to screw it up. And then yeah. Peter will email me and say, Ulysses, what the heck were you doing? By the way, I have to um, thank you, because after we did our part one, I reached out and I connected with Peter, and I'm actually going to interview him tomorrow for the podcast. Oh, man, so, Peter is, man, he's he's heavy, man, bad cat. Uh, thank you um, for the recommendation. Oh, no, he's great, man. You're going to get, like, like first of all, when he starts talking about his educational, like, like all the things that he's doing with his team, he's brilliant, man. Um, but anyway, the, so the name of this course, is called Jazz Drumming 101, Everything You Need to Know to Get the Gig. Yeah. So so I'm excited. I it's like, <laughs> yeah, so, it's, so I'm bridging, you know, all of my, I feel like that's the exciting thing is I'm bridging all of my work together now. So, you know, UOJ Gen Y can feed into the big band. You know, my business book feeds into this course, you know, so I'm really trying to create one stream where everything flows. And so what that course is gonna be about is, really cutting like the fat, man, as my grandmother would say, chew the meat, spit the bones, like spit out the bones. So like I'm giving people the meat about what does it really take to like to get the gig as a drummer? Because I find that like, you have all these books where it's like, oh, check out Wilcoxon, check out Syncopation, check right. out, you know, no no shade to him, but Tommy Igo's book and you know, this one's book. And, but the reality is, and Tommy Igo will tell you himself, what actually got him the gig was probably none of those exercises right. <laughs> was his ability to play a groove or, you know, Wilcoxon. You're not going to get a gig because you know, Wilcoxon. You're right. not. I've, and, and anybody that wants to debate me about that, I'm happy to do it. Because if you sit down and a singer calls you to go play a hundred dollar gig at a restaurant and you start playing batting in rhythm, you will get fired. <laughs> Right? right. So what my course is about is what are the things that you need to know to gig? And I'm excited about that. And we, we did, it's called a mini course. So I think it's about maybe an hour and a half, two hours worth of information. So those are the current projects, man. That's what I'm working on. You know? Yeah. Wow. So much great stuff. Thank you. I, yeah. Is there anything else you want to cover while we're, while we're uh, chatting? Cause I listened back to part one and we actually, yeah. you know, um, thanks to your generosity with your time, we actually covered a lot. So yeah, right. no, yeah, well, well, I would just say, you know, um, w what I love about what you're doing is I think that it's bringing together multiple communities. And um, it's, you know, before we were kind of all separate, you know, you sort of had the presenters and promoters kind of in their world. And, and then they only talked to us when we had work and then we were in our world and, you know, all of that. And I think what COVID did was it kind of brought us all around the same screen, 100%. you know, yeah. so. I think that these kinds of conversations are great. If I, you know, anytime I have an opportunity to speak to presenters or promoters, I always say the same message. The message is this one, make sure that yes, you have to make money. You cannot, you know, book and present things that they don't make money. But I think in this new age, let's make sure that we're making room for the next generation, because I feel like that so much of jazz in particular is still rooted obviously in the tradition, which it should be, but I feel like we're not really leaving room for the next generation. I feel like it's like, we want them to go to school. Um, we want them to, to, to be educated. We want them to hang out at our gigs, but we don't really want to book them for certain things, you know? And so my, my message to promoters is always, hey man, like create the lineage. Like don't, don't stop um, looking for who's next in the business, but not also next, the next star. 
like it's also important to know that like not everybody in Art Blakey's band was a star. You know what I mean? Not everybody in Betty Carter's band was a star, but and and I feel like we're kind of in this place where okay, we'll go get this 16 year old who's really really killing, but then we forget about the rest of their big band and how can we give them also a space to develop. Um, so I, I I hope for presenters and promoters that we create an opportunity really and genuinely for the next generation. And I also think that let's make sure that in this new space of being inclusive and equitable and all that, that we're not patronizing. Um, I think that, you know, like I was just at a venue um, that I will not name, so don't ask me to do that, Mike. Um, <laughs> I was at this venue that I will not name and they started the concert with this message saying we are an equitable and just venue and we are here for all people and we promote diverse and equitable agendas or something like that and the whole audience was white <laughs> and i said to my friends i said the performance i said if they were so equitable equitable and diverse where's the bus of school bus of kids from any pick any community right, right. <laughs> that could have been given the opportunity to see this concert because that's like me saying you know i really love you know making time to do zoom interviews but every time somebody emails me like i never make time for it right you know what i mean you know how you know i'm into it because i'm sitting on the zoom call with you right? right and i think that in this f in this new space because everybody got called out because of cancel culture Mm -hmm. I feel like a lot of presenters and promoters are trying to create these like hodgepodge um, programming moments to appear that they're uh, inclusive or supportive of certain communities or all communities when reality they, is they're not. And my thing is, let's just be honest about it. And if we're honest about it, then we can actually shift and say, okay, how can we be better? So that's the one thing that I think starting to get a little bit dangerous. Like I filled out a grant application the other day and they literally asked me, what was my sexuality? They asked me my race. They asked me my religion. And I was just like, what does my sexual choice or my religion have to do with, am I gonna be a good rep recipient of this grant or representative of this grant? Yeah. Like I'm a musician. And, and so now I feel like we're getting into these spaces where we're trying to like create these like quotas or meet these quotas. And my question is, are one, we creating great art? Because great art, as far as anybody, you and I both have been inspired by people from multiple walks of life, right? And, you know, you think about, you know, whatever favorite, like we mentioned the name Art Blakey, me and you both will start drooling. Not because he's black, <laughs> because he's a great drummer. <laughs> and so I think that we are getting to this threshold where we're like starting to like, like, I feel like excellence and trying to appear diverse and inclusive and all that is starting to be at war with each other mm -hmm. and i and 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 it's and that war is creating a baby that i want to that i feel is patronization and um i just don't i don't like it i don't like it at all because like for instance if you look back in the day when you saw jerry mulligan on stage with blakey or you saw you know dave brubeck or you saw different white musicians who worked a lot with black musicians or you saw women on melba liston on stage you knew they were some of the best musicians <laughs> Right. And it just so happened that they were black or they it just so happened that they were white or it just so happened that Melba Liston is a woman or it just so happened that Toshiko is an incredible woman and J Japanese like and I think we're now kind of putting the cart before the horse. Um, so anyway, I know that's a very long tangent as I seem to be in that mood today, but I, I feel I like if I were to get a chance to speak directly to promoters and presenters that's something that I would love to share but I but I and I know this is about you interviewing other people I'd love to know your thoughts about that point. Well, yeah. Well, first of all, I was just thinking, um, I don't want to completely put you on the spot, but you just got me thinking, obviously this dialogue is happening, but, but the, uh, I, I'm, I'm trying to relate it to how impactful the, um, uh, series you've been doing, you know, with drummers is right. Right. Mostly because it's, it's your experience as a world-class professional musician talking to world-class professional musicians. So what if there was an opportunity where, if you were interested, you could have these conversations with uh, presenting organizations that really do want yeah. to make these inroads and sure. not come across as patronizing, you know, because like we're in a very interesting time right now with um, all this money that's been released. Right. For the shuttered venue operators right. grants. Um, and so obviously, you know, we're 
it's it's hard to lump everything into this massive grant because right. you have to think about the venues that had to survive for over a year. Uh, right. Okay, so clearly, like they need the lifeline. But you know, for any organizations out there where um, they were also fortunate enough to receive the funds and can be in a position to do right. exactly what you just said, why don't you why don't you reach out to that community and right. and see like. Maybe it's a school that's not in the greatest of areas. Who never, and those right. students never have a chance to be exposed. Right. To Maybe they could bust them out there. Maybe they could, right. you know, if that money is there, it's things like, and that would make such a big difference. Absolutely. Well, well to your point, so I, I had a chance um, about a month ago, I got invited to speak to what's called, I guess, like the Florida Presenters, um, like this uh, sort of coalition yeah, or consortium. You know, yeah. So I got asked to speak to them and the topic was basically like race like race, art, art and race or whatever. Um, and that they asked me the same question at the end. And I, I basically said to all of them, all of them, I said, hey, I'm happy to consult if you got, you know, if anybody wants to hire me, whatever I said, but separate from if you never hire me, if we never work together, whatever, here's what I think every venue in, in America should do. Every venue in America should absolutely have a real educational component. Mm -hmm. And I don't mean, you know, you know, uh, education is Robert Glasper, I'm just using him as, an, a, 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 as a name, or Melissa Aldana, whomever, is in sound check, and you bring in six people to watch their sound check, and at the end of the sound check, they're, you know, answering three questions. That's not education. And so I think we need to add an educational outreach to every venue. So whether you are, you know, like if you're not a club, but I mean like an actual perform, like a PAC or a theater, and to me, it should be very simple. If that artist is in town for two days, not some artist, every artist should should do like a talk, like a, a school, con like a, what do you call it, like a day concert or whatever, you know, mm -hmm. children's concert. And I think there also should be an opportunity if a children's concert cannot be planned, there should be an opportunity where a whole night or something can be sponsored for children who don't have access to the arts to get there. And I think if you start doing that, this new generation will have an appetite for what we do. Because what we're dealing with now is you have a lot of people who don't have an appetite for what we do. And, and because I work in the advocacy space of working with what I call at Hope Children, I'm working with a lot of kids constantly in Florida. That is like my life's work. I can't tell you how many kids, like we do, you know, our thing is musical theater. How many kids are getting exposed to the art of musical theater for the first time every year? Yeah. And so I look at, to me, you've got this PAC who's spending, you know, millions of dollars on a facility and then even more money on programming, but you don't give some children an opportunity to be exposed to the art. And what we don't realize is if we don't do that, we will not have an audience. That's why I feel like it's really a cold red right now because I, you know, and people are like, oh, you, you're so passionate about it. I'm like, I'm passionate about it because I'm talking to my kids and I'm saying something as simple as like, do you know who, you know, Cats on Broadway? Have you ever seen Lion King on Broadway? And many of them are like, no. You know why? Because some of them grew up in the hood or they grew up with parents who also didn't get a chance to go to a concert. And then their parents didn't get to go to a concert. Sure. So now you've got a household with three generations of people who've never been to a jazz concert or never been to a musical theater concert. Right. So to me, I think we're spending a lot of time talking about inclusivity and, 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 and uh, diversity and all that, which is the right conversation, but to what length? Like, it shouldn't just be programming. It should be, who are we exposing to this art? Because if we expose it, then we create the hunger and the appetite. And yes, they may want to become artists, but even if they don't want to become artists, even if they choose to be a school teacher, they will still want to go out for date night to a jazz club because they remember having that great experience. So to me, those are the things that I think we're missing in our community, particularly the jazz community, where I think everybody needs to subscribe to the same method and tools of how we get, we allow this music to stay alive. And I, and I think other industries are doing it. Like the, the media, the pop industry has already done it. It is in the school systems. You know, the, uh, I feel like the classical music system has done it. Like, but I feel like these niche industries, like what we do, we, we, we aren't doing it. So, you know, that, that's my real feeling about, um, I feel like what's missing and what I, what I love presenters to be thinking about. Yeah, absolutely. And certainly there are organizations, um, hopefully some that are listening to this conversation, who actually are doing a really good job of it. Absolutely. There are some right? out there. And I wonder, too, can they, they have, you know, they've got the uh, 
proven methodology. They've got the, re, you know, the connections, right. but they've got the whole system built in. I wonder right. if those presenters could also step forward and, serve, right. you know, be leaders to any organization that really wants to. And it doesn't have to be, you know, it's not like you're asking a organization to uh, do this 365. I mean, if you just think about Absolutely. the impact they could make, you know, let's, let's just like shoot them for the goal once a month, right? Just start right. there. Okay. Right. 12 concerts a year that right. uh, young children have the opportunity to see that mm. we you've just impacted how many thousands of lives. And I mean, yeah, yeah. I, I know the exact moment I knew music was important to me was um, I grew up outside of DC and mm. uh, I, I was either 10 or 11 and my, uh, my class got to take a trip to the National Symphony. And it's, 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 I get goosebumps just thinking about it because I, I always remember two things from that concert. One, I remember sitting there watching the orchestra play and literally having the hair stand up on my right. arms. Right, that right. feeling. And the other thing I always remember is looking at my friends and expecting them to be like, Man, this is so great. And, and they're right. just all like out to lunch. <laughs> exactly. But, but also, but think about that, Mike, that ability or that, that opportunity came to you based on the life that your parents made possible for you, right? 100%. Like, no. like there's a, there, you grew up outside of DC, probably, you know, whatever com community in terms of the infrastructure of the kind of school that even created that kind of curriculum. You know, there's right. so many, like for you to even be able to say that, there's so many benchmarks <laughs> that, you know I, what I'm absolutely. saying? And this is no shade to you. Yeah. This is just reality of, for you to even be able to, and the fact that your first experience was the National Symphony, like that's, that, that is, it has so many different. Um, oh, it has many implications. Yeah. yeah, implications, right? And so, and so I think to your point, like a couple organizations I'd love to spotlight that are doing it well is uh, in St. Louis, Jazz, you know, Jazz at the Bistro. Yeah. Um, uh, Jazz St. Louis, I, I get confused which name they use because it, it's, you know, but they have a great educational program. I remember being booked there and part of my contract was we had to come in I think Friday and Saturday and basically do our show in an educational format for school kids, yeah. you know? Yeah. And, now, and now it was really, really dope. Another organization, obviously Jazz at Lincoln Center, um, who has, you know, they have Jazz in the Schools program. They have their children's concerts. Um, another organization, Jazz Asthma Snowmass, um, yes. which now has a great partnership as well with University of Miami. Um, they're doing great work. You, you've also got, uh, what's the other one? Um, Oh, SF Jazz, you know, um, you know, and then same Monterey, you know, which uh, Tim Jackson has, you know, Kumba, which is sort of the annual thing. And then he's got a great masterclass series that's built into that. Down here in the South, there's a cool club called the Jazz Corner. And they've got a really great program that they have like a, a like a little big band or thing that they do. Uh, I know Savannah Music Festival, I, I actually had a position with them last year where they have a jazz academy and they have a, like musical explorers program. So I think I say all that to say there are programs out there doing that. Um, I right. love it. I love to see it go from being 10 or 15 to everybody to your point, implementing some level of that within their program. Sure, absolutely. Well, I'll just go ahead and offer anybody in the arts listening to this that uh, wants to chime in on the conversation, just send me an email. Uh, yeah. You can just email booking at epsteinco.com and, um, and uh, Ulysses, I'll filter anything out, but <laughs> if sure, I get sure. anything, I'll definitely include yeah. you in the conversation because yeah, uh, you, you couldn't have said it better that it is a code red, especially for you as a performer, that next, that audience has to be there. <laughs> yeah. For me yeah. as a booking agent, that audience has to be there. <laughs> right, right. You know, it, it, it's, it's, it's interesting times, man. I, 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 another thing that I liked, um, and I'll, I'll sort of close with this, that Jazz Bistro did as well. And I got called, um, about the conversation, and I thought it was so brilliant, was that they have now decided to uh, name, like, like they have sort of like an artistic ambassador, and it's going to be Keon Harrell, which I absolutely love. Uh, Keon and I have known each other for many years, but what they're doing is they're they're engaging, and maybe this is a cool idea that other agent or other uh, entities can can include or institutions. So they're engaging Keon, obviously, to book his band. But because Keon is so brilliant at like really um, merging like the hip hop world and the jazz world, they're also asking him to curate things. And they're also asking him, you know, his uh, opinion on education, their education program. And so they've got him in there, not just, you know, throwing him on a few things, but like he's being able to kind of help shift the culture of 
that organization. And what I love so much about it being Keon is that Keon is from East St. Louis, you know, grew up uh, in the neighborhood with some of the greatest musicians. Um, and he understands that city and he, and he's a product of it. And so to me, even that makes sense. Like, you know, I would love to see these different organizations um, employ people that have even been a product of, of that city and, or, or, you know, international talent who still may have a tie, strong tie to that city. Um, or like, for instance, with myself, like I'm, I'm an artist and all that, but like, I'm really passionate about advocacy and education and community. And so when I come to an institution, I don't just come and say, oh, I'm excited to play. I'm also saying, okay, are we, are, what are the touch points within the community? Have you, have you reached out to your local shelters? Have you reached out you know, to your local schools? Which schools? Are we you know, pri private or public school? You know, how are we you know, uh, you know, mingling within the community? How many free concerts are there? So my mind comes to every institution with certain questions because I've been running the community-based program for almost 15 years. So I think even that idea of what uh, the Bistro did, I know George Ween did the same thing with Christian McBride in Newport, you know, and I've seen, I remember I was in McBride's band when he got that call and I've just seen the Newport Festival positively implement new ideas, you know, and, and just new initiatives. And I know that is, uh, that is uh, McBride and his ability and to work with the team. So I still that to say that might even be a good thing for people to think about as well is how do you get an artist or an ambassador in to even be part of the conversations, not just playing and then putting them back in the plane, but letting them see your year or two year plan. What is your art? What is an artist's perspective of, of you know, your curriculum, you know, or your outreach program, you know, because an artist might come in and be like, well, that program is like, like, I wouldn't want to. I wouldn't even want to show up on a Saturday for that, you know? So anyway, I think though, these kind of things could be really cool ideas and ways to, to again, uh, nurture and create the next generation of not just musicians. Cause I think jazz has been focused on, oh, we got to create the next generation of cats, but it's not just about the cats or the people or the musicians. It's about the audience. We have to also cultivate a new audience. You know what I think would be helpful is if you put together like a simple one page document with those very touch points you just mentioned outlined because again for organizations trying to get their head around this you you know here's boom 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 have you thought of these six seven things um and also for other musicians too who are finding themselves increasingly in this uh situation yeah. where they have an opportunity to do these yeah. types of outreach and i mean because right. you've you've really not obviously you've got the experience doing this but you uh i think um if you if you could do that and send it to me, that'd be great. <laughs> well, I'll do this. One, that's a consulting thing for me. But but one, but I'll say this. Fair enough. That but but Mike, I'll say this. That is in um, the book, um, and not you know it is a shameless plug. But there's a section that I have that's called keys to community engagement. All right. And that was so so I I I'll say this in a short uh, thing because you you've been very generous as well with your time. The book particularly the last part of it has things that I've not seen in any other branding, you know, or educational or music, but like I, I basically put picked from sections of other in industries and put them all in this one book for musicians. And um, the, the touch point piece, there's some aspects of that, but in the keys to community engagement, engagement as an artist, I tell my own stories about how I got it wrong, how I, came to the community initially being like, hey, I'm here to save you. And they kind of were just like, get lost, <laughs> you know? Wow. And then when I was able to come back to them, it was when I created these connecting points. And, it's, and, and, and that's in there, which, you know, one was authenticity. I, I first came to the community and said, oh, I'm this guy, I've had this really cool life and I want to help you. And they're like, get lost, I can't pay my rent. And I don't know if I'm going to be able to feed my kid tomorrow. So unless you're helping me with that, like, you can kick rocks. <laughs> wow. So the, the, the first touch point for me was shed the ego, shed the fancy degree, shed all this BS. And what is my authentic, authentic, excuse me, approach and authentic, genuine desire to connect with the community? Is it for, the, you know, like I heard this quote, I think Mark Cuban, um, which I'm certain, you know, uh, says motivate people for their reasons, not yours. And so the first thing yeah. as a touch point is authenticity. Why am I coming to you and your community? And is it for you or is it for me? So that is very much in, in that chapter. And I also talk about 
the relevancy of what you actually play to them, right? So if you call me and book me to go play to Strathmore, you book me to play Birdland, there's a certain kind of program that I'm going to play at Birdland and Strathmore that I'm not going to play if I'm setting up a stage in the middle of, uh, of, of a community that has a certain kind of socioeconomic challenges. Yeah. I'm going to play things that they know. You know what I mean? Right. So, or, or take something they know and make it jazzy and maybe swing over it. So I, I think in, in terms of those touch points, I think a lot of it has to do with um, really looking at the environment and taking yourself out of it and really figuring out how can you make authentic and genuine connections and, and how can you be relevant with your art to their current situation. Yes. So I think to your point about those touch points, I absolutely, if any organization was interested in working with me, yes, I will consult. I can, I can, because the other thing is, if I sent you my, you know, five, six touch points, okay, that could work for one type of business. But what All if right. you and I said, what if you said to me, oh, well, Ulysses, we, we want to do this in the middle of, you know, Poduck, Idaho. Well, now I've got to go there and I've got to really do a, an analysis and get on the grounds and really understand who they are. Because let's say my five touch points really work better for, you know, BPOC communities. But if I'm dealing with, let's say, a white community who has some of the same socioeconomic challenges and, and they still also haven't had a chance, you know, to get access to the arts, I got to now understand how do I reach them? Because what worked for me in Florida for some kids who are, you know, uh, Hispanic, Indigenous, and Black may not work for those who have been living on farms, <laughs> you know? Absolutely. So I think, yeah. I think to your point, I, I love the question and it was very much um, appreciated and I think it's real, but I also think that still speaks to we're trying to create a formula that we can right. streamline as opposed to what I think we have to do is be much more curatorial about these different communities because they all need different things, Absolutely. you know? So it's, 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 you know, it's, it's different, man. So I think, I think if each uh, institution tapped into the community authentically, genuinely, and consistently, right? right? consistently right. not oh for our 2021 season or 2021 22 season we're going to do a really cool concert and a pop-up stage and da, da 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 and that was a great thing and we brought out all the photographers and we got like a great moment and to you know we did a thing and it was all on social media and then 22 23 is never heard of again so again yeah. those uh, you know i know it's, it, it's sort of brent you know a bunch of stuff yeah, you but also I think make a really good booking agent in addition to everything else you get it <laughs> <laughs> ah, ah. <laughs> Listen, ask Miles. Miles will tell you. Something. He's like, "Are you the booking agent or the manager? Or are you the artist?" I'm like, "So Miles, so uh, call up so and so, so and so, and then we're gonna do this." <laughs> yeah. No, I mean, you're just you're so you're so tuned in. I mean, obviously, it makes sense. But yeah, you're just so tuned in to the, the to the dialogue. I forget who said it, but you know, the the great is great marketing advice. Always enter the conversation occurring in other people's minds. You know, interesting. And, and that's what you're talking about. Why you can't have a simple, okay, these five bullet points work for this city, yeah. but they're not going to work for this. Yeah, makes right. total sense. So, right, um, which goes back to Mike tokenism. What this tokenism and you know, and this sort of uh, the appearance of diversity and da 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 mm -hmm. is we're cr trying to create these these. Uh, now we're trying to create diversity as it pertains to like a chart. So if we have right. twenty five percent, you know, if we have ten grant recipients. You know, 20% were black, you know, of that 20%, five were women of the, you know, man, that's, I don't, I don't think we're going to create change doing that. I think what we need to look at is say, Hey, for the last 20 years, we've had only, you know, white males be recipient. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, why were these guys recipient? Were they all really, really talented people and they did the work? Okay. Well, cool. So we shouldn't feel bad about that. However, what we do know is the next 10 years, we don't want that same model because there are other people that also have great ideas. You see what I'm saying? That's a different vantage point from, well, we can't have any more white men. No, because that's some, I mean, you you bad cat. Like not, so now we're now we're moving you out of the conversation because you fit a model <laughs> that, that has been overrepresented. You know, I just I think we're getting into a really interesting space. And and I think to your point about. Uh, the, the conversations occurring, you know, or, or however the quote was, we've got to really come to the conversation being more aware of what's outside of our opinion or our, our viewpoint. Yeah. And I think then we'll be able to make a more sober 
an oh, impactful yeah. decision. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, I uh, I don't want to take up any more time, but yeah, I mean, you just cool. you know, because we then we haven't even gotten into the whole thing about how bias factors into the arts, and that's a whole nother podcast episode right there. <laughs> Brother, we could be talking all day. You know, I, I will tell you a book um, that I love that people hey, would You're support. so great at this. That's the last question I was going to ask you. Literally, I'm gonna <laughs> what books have you read lately on any topic that you are most likely to recommend? <laughs> <laughs> We're two and in, Mike. We got to start a business together. I'm all for it. <laughs> um, but uh, what I will say, uh, a book that I think everybody should read, one of my favorite writers is Malcolm Gladwell. Um, and obviously I love the book called Outliers or Outli you know, I, I've, I've heard Outliers or Outliers, whatever the yeah, pronunciation is. Uh, uh, it's probably on my shelf over here, but yeah, of course. Yeah, but that's a good book. But the book that ties into what you and I just talked about is a book called Blink. And yes. it's a really powerful book and it deals with bias. Um, and it deals with, you know, that, that blink of an eye when you see something based on your conditioning and your fears and all that, what does it activate in your mind? And I think that's a really good book. Another one, man, that is blowing my mind. I'm, I'm certain you probably already know. Um, do you know the, the writer and entrepreneur, Simon Sinek? Do you know about yeah. him? Oh, bro. So he, he wrote a book, three books. Um, I've only started with his last one. Uh, the first book is called Starting With Your Why. And so he's really big on crafting, you know, helping us to craft our why statement okay. um, and why we do things. The second one, which I have, is called Leaders Eat Last, which is so beautiful. Readers and it's really last. about- yeah, leaders eat last. Yeah, and it leaders really talks about yeah, leaders. Yeah, and it talks about like leaders need to, you know, this idea of leadership normally means you're ahead and you're like like sort of people are catering to you and what the best leaders are actually champ the ones that champion other people and push other people forward. But the one that is rocking my socks and I'm currently reading right now is called The Infinite. Uh actually I'll pull it right here, The Infinite Game. And uh here we go. Yeah, the infinite game. This thing, man, is so deep and is based on a theory by this, uh, I think he's, he was a physicist, Dr. James Kars, uh, in which he talked about infinite and uh, finite games. Obviously, finite games are things like football, basketball, you know, where a finite game is where, you know, either a group of people or a team of people are playing, they're opposing each other, and there's winning points, and, you know, there's a winner and a loser. In infinite games, there is no loser. It's really more about the long goal. You know, so life is an infinite game. You know, relationships, wow. marriage, all those things are infinite because the, the goal is this like sort of overarching fulfillingness and commitment to the, uh, like the unknowing. And the finite is this sort of very measured uh, uh, success or whatever. So I this very, I, I know I'm taking a lot of time, but this really cool story. I've got nothing but time. Okay, great, great. So this cool story, and I think it ties into what we said. So this really cool story where he talks about Microsoft and Apple and he talks about there was a moment where Apple had released the iPod and it was all the rave. And so Microsoft had literally invested millions of dollars into like the, is it called like a, not a and uh, Yeah, the Zoom. Have you I heard this story? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, Tell me the story, but I had a Zoom and it, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so 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 they, they uh, I forget what the team is called that is a, a development, but anyway, so Microsoft developed like or put millions of dollars into developing uh, the perfect uh, competition in this device, and they literally analyzed every thing that the i the the iPod didn't have. Mm -hmm. So they created the Zoom. Well, they said apparently there was some tech conference where uh, uh, an Apple employee and Microsoft like took a cab back to like the hotel together, and the Microsoft employee said to the Apple employee, "Hey man, we're really about to kick your butt." Uh, with this thing that we're about to get, you know, we're about to take over the, the the iPod MP3 player market. And the Apple executive basically said, wow, you probably are. Best wishes, right? <laughs> Three to six months later, Apple lets go of the MP3 and they create the iPhone. <laughs> <laughs> and so what, um, what, what Simon Sinek talks about is that Apple is always playing the infinite game. And there, and also in an infinite game, you are only in competition with yourself. Sure. And he talks about how, like, basically, Steve Jobs was like, "All right, we've done the MP3 thing, we rocked that. How else can we get more tapped into our audience? Like, okay, we've already got them listening to music. Well, what is the other thing that everybody needs? Well, it's a phone. Well, what if we put that together? Well, what else does everybody need? They need a camera. What else do they need? So he basically created this product." That is a, a, a direct result of all the things that we needed. So Microsoft was thinking about iPods 
iPod was thinking about how do we get further ingrained and entrenched into the daily lives of you know, consumers. And, and so he talks about the infinite mindset leads to that kind of impact because you're actually competing with yourself and trying to get further into the sort of a just cause and creating something that is just crazy impactful versus finite thinkers are very much like, oh, well, you know, I beat you this first quarter or whatever. So anyway, um, talking about books, I think Blink is really good because it deals with bias. Um, obviously, shout out to my book. It helps you to understand different musicians and, and, and sort of the entrepreneurial world of being a musician. I love the infinite game because it kind of gets us out of that like competitive, you know, metric system of I got to beat you. I got to beat you, which is can also a part of entrepreneurial life that I don't like. So those are some books that I think we all should embrace because I think it can change how we how we show up. Um, and this other one too, I have to grab that I've been reading. Um, if if um, I will give this one away, uh, people want to do community work. Yeah. This is great. Uh, called the new Com new creative community. Have you read this? No. Yeah, who's, who's it by? Um, it's by Arlene Goldbard, but okay. it's really uh, she's great and she's probably one of the most. Uh, respected authors on community cultural development. And so she really unpacks a lot of theories around uh, creative community, but also like how do you tap into different neighborhoods? And she has all these great analysis of different communities that she has observed or different works, like even something simple as like, you know, the Navajo community painting a mural that honors the ancestors on that ground and how that brought together the community, you know? So, so I think a lot of organizations should definitely read this book because it can help them adapt kind of a new way of maybe their outreach program or whatever. So anyway, those are some books I'm, I'm reading right now. Oh, well, thank you for offering those. And I would also add uh, just on the uh, topic of, of bias and everything that I, a book I read last year that really opened my eyes. It's called, I'm reading it off of here. It's called um, Bias, Uncovering the Hidden Prejudice that Shapes What We See, Think and Do by wow, Jennifer that. Eberhardt. Uh, wow, she's a, she's a professor at Stanford. Oh, and, nice. and it, it really, uh, I'm going to just uh, <laughs> single out all the white listeners here who really need to, uh, really need to begin to understand how they're seeing things and more mm. importantly, how they're not seeing things. And mm. I can't recommend this book enough, Biased by Jennifer Eberhardt. Um, Jennifer Eberhardt. This is what an absolute pleasure, man. I, oh, man. You know, I, I, I knew part two was going to be really good. And because of the kindness of your spirit, this took us to some places I couldn't have even predicted. And what a, what a pleasure for me that you've inspired me. And um, I'm going to have trouble sleeping tonight. My, 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 uh, the wheels are turning. <laughs> well, man, listen, I have, I have such respect for you, Mike. Um, normally, I'm very finite with interviews <laughs> um, because I, you know, I have a limited amount of time. But I, I just want to give kudos to you of your ability to be so interested in, in building a new world, you know, oh, thank you. and interested in the information and, and getting it out there. So it makes me open up in a certain kind of way. And man, we, we haven't figured it out yet, but we gotta, we gotta find a way to work together. So yeah, uh, I just like how you think and, and how you challenge me as well. Cause I think you understand more about the entrepreneurial space than I do. So I, it'd be great to, to create something. So I'm sure that. I'm going to send you sure that back filter. I, I'd please, love to please. see you, what you think of it. Yeah. Cool, man. Uh, okay, last Thank question real quick. Where oh, sure. can people go to connect with you? How can they find you? What's the easiest sure, way? Sure, man. You, UlyssesOwensJr.com and um, I'll spell and that out. has everything. Yeah, UlyssesOwensJr.com. It'll lead you right to me. And from that has all my social media. And I actually have a personal email address on there that people want to shoot me an email. They can reach me. So Excellent. Stop there. Cool. All right. Thank you, man. Is, thank you so much. This was a real All pleasure. Right. Take care, brother. Bye. All right.